It's been years since the release of Nintendo's fighting game ARMS for the Nintendo Switch, and in that time, the world and gameplay of the stretchiest fighting game known to man has been refined to an impeccable degree. And simultaneously, while this game became the gift that kept on giving, I have just been soaking up all it has to offer. To put it bluntly, it's easily my most played video game. It beats my playtime for other games I spent a great deal of time with by around sevenfold. Anyhow, from day one, I always had intentions of taking the time to talk about this unique title again at a later date in a more nuanced and critical manner than I did previously at the game's launch on June 16, 2017. Now is that time. From top to bottom this time, I will be discussing and analyzing everything from the game's conception, its release, its gameplay, its world, and its competitive scene. Saddle up. Can you make a fighting game with the camera behind the player? This is the question that sparked the development of ARMS. It's a question that to some might seem rather basic. Of course it's possible. Games like Virtualon, Gundam Extreme Versus, and even For Honor exist. And if you want to get really ludicrous, you can include all those licensed anime arena fighters like Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm, Jumpstar's Victory Versus, and My Heroes Wants Justice into the mix as well. However, while this question may seem rather simple, the basic principle when making games in Nintendo is creating games that are unique. Which is to say that for the producer of ARMS, Kosuke Yabuki, making a game that was like Gundam Extreme Versus or something more traditional like Street Fighter or Tekken was not going to cut it. According to Yabuki in his GDC presentation on ARMS in 2018, he said, Nintendo places importance on being unique above all else. If Miyamoto-san asks me what makes this different and I don't have an answer, I'm finished. So essentially, Yabuki and company were tasked with creating a game without the exact same core design principles and caveats found in other 3D arena fighters. This self-imposed challenge also meant that they had to find their own solutions to translating the mechanics of 2D fighting games into 3D. This would prove no easy feat as shown by how few high quality 3D arena fighters exist. One must understand that fighting games were made with a 2D side view because it was the easiest way for a player to adjust distance between themselves and their opponent this way. This 2D camera view makes battles infinitely more clear and readable for a player as it is intuitively understood just by playing the game that in exchange for the risk of being hit by an opponent, one moves in closer to hit them. This idea of battle legibility is fairly simple to display and build around in a game with a side view camera perspective like Street Fighter or Tekken. But in the behind the back arena fighter, this issue is actually really tough to solve. This is because using a third person camera perspective makes it hard to adjust distance between oneself and the opponent. It inherently makes it hard to know whether attacks will come up short and whiff or hit their mark. Arms producer Yabuki even said if players are fully mobile on top of that, this lack of tactile precision will lead to a fight that just isn't worthwhile, when referring to the struggle of creating legible distance attacks in a fully 3D fighter. However, despite these hurdles, the developers of ARMS overcame them in their own unique way. Returning to the initial question of can you make a fighting game with the camera behind the player? Shintaro Jikumaru, the design director of ARMS, gave an unorthodox answer. That answer being to create a game in which attacks are guaranteed to reach their opponent given enough time. This approach was inspired by Jikumaru and company's experience developing titles with the Nintendo Entertainment Planning and Development Group No. 9 as developers of the Mario Kart franchise. Jikumaru's game idea used a similar concept to that of Mario Kart by having obstacles that could be clearly seen in the distance and having the goal be for players to steer around them before they reach them. The ARMS development team wanted the idea of whether attacks will reach or not to already be accounted for, so the player only has to worry about their attack hitting or missing. With this game idea in hand, a prototype was developed using the motion control capabilities of the prototype Joy-Con as a base. The motion controls ARMS is so known for came about because according to Yabuki in his 2018 GDC presentation on ARMS, it seemed to me that with our current technology, more precise and accurate motion controls could be realized, and we could make a game where advanced players could pursue highly technical play. Nonetheless, Yabuki also wanted players to be able to play in any way they wanted, whether that be with motion controls or button controls, on a big television screen or on the Switch's small handheld display. He wanted a freedom of play style just like his past work, Mario Kart 8, which supported many different controllers and options. 
When the prototype for ARMS, basic humanoid models were used and a lot of the basic gameplay ideas were put in place, such as curving punches, different weapon types that were capable of being chosen before a match, mini games like Skill Shot, and a 2 vs 2 mode. However, in addition to this, elements that were merely experimented with but later scrapped were tested in this phase as well, such as a bowling minigame, a first person perspective, and a light and heavy blow system that was dictated by how hard the Joy-Con was swung. Furthermore, other concepts such as having Yoshi fight with his tongue or having Link fight with his hook shocks were tested with as well to see if existing Nintendo characters were a match for this type of game the team wanted to make. Upon seeing that existing characters would not work for this new type of fighting game they were trying to make, numerous character designs and art styles were made to try and figure out exactly what this new title would look like. Unfortunately, after having tried numerous body proportions, Yabuki and company were still not satisfied. Actually, the arms didn't extend at first, said Yabuki in an interview with Glexel. In the first prototype, the characters were holding these kind of hookshot things that had these extendable parts that flew out, but it just didn't look right on the screen. It didn't feel responsive. Things felt like they were going way off into the distance and it just felt all wrong. So Mr. Ishikawa, the art director for ARMS, suggested that rather than extending from the hands, we do it from the shoulder. We take the sleeves off completely and stretch out the whole arms. In doing that, things wouldn't feel like they were too detached. That's ultimately how all these characters came about. Before, when it was the characters holding these extended devices that just shot something out, it just felt too much like the sensation of holding the Joy-Con. What you were doing in real life and what your character was doing on screen, you were both holding something in your hands. It just felt off. There was too much of a lag. When we changed it to extending from the shoulder and then steering the punches with your hands, it felt closer and more intuitive. It made more of a connection between what you were doing with the controller and what was happening on screen. With this change made, it seemed as if the core of the game had finally taken shape. A 3D arena fighter with customizable, long-range punches that was capable of being played via precise motion controls or a traditional button layout. A game that was easy to pick up and play, but became deeper in terms of strategy the more you played. A game that much like Mario Kart 8 before it, would be broadly accessible but have depth. A fighting game would be nothing without the characters that inhabit them. So the ARMS team put special care into crafting characters that had one unifying theme, having arms in the shape of a spiral. Yabuki even went as far as to say, we set about exploring a motif of different extendable things, things that could stay compact but then stretch and extend when punching. However, despite this one unifying theme that tied in with one of ARMS' main gameplay quirks, the ARMS team also wanted to make sure each fighter had characteristics that stood out in order to make sure the cast was a colorful group of fighters and that people from all walks of life could find someone in the cast that resonated with them. In addition to that, the ARMS team also put a large focus on the body types represented within the game according to art director Masaki Ishikawa. So given that this is a fighting game with a couple more realistic character designs for the bodies, we paid close attention to the height to body ratio and the character design, making it close to that of real people. We worked really hard to make these characters appear solid, muscular type characters, both male and female. But we also wanted to, for players that are maybe a little more casual, for them to be easy to pick up, and we gave the faces some features that make them more approachable, and colors that sort of pop to make this game more approachable for even the casual players. The ARMS team wanted the characters to be distinct. They wanted characters that one could get an understanding of simply by looking at the back of their head and torso via the behind the back camera perspective. This naturally didn't come easy, but with time, the base roster of 10 fighters was created and ARMS was released into the world on June 16, 2017. After a debut at the initial 2017 Switch presentation in January, two dedicated ARMS Directs, an online demo, and an invitational tournament at E3 2017, ARMS was released on June 16, 2017. The game was about as stripped of the bare essentials as a fighting it could get at the time. You only had 10 characters, a ranked mode for competitive play, party match for more casual fun, Grand Prix for an arcade mode experience, a versus mode, local multiplayer between multiple switches, and option to pair with friends online. The basic gameplay in ARMS is simple. You have a left punch, a right punch, a grab, a block, an insta-counter, 
a dash, a jump, an air dash, and rush, which is basically the equivalent of a super attack. It's also possible to charge your arms by holding down the dash button after a dash, or holding down the jump button after a jump. Charge attacks are faster, do more damage, and activate an arm's unique elemental properties. All characters are capable of performing these basic actions. However, in addition to this, there is the arm's loadout system. At launch, there are 30 different arms that each of the 10 base characters could choose from. It helps to think of these different equipable arms as different weapons with their own unique attributes and weight class. For example, the Chilla is a medium weight glove that plows through lightweight arms and upon landing a charged hit, freezes opponents in place. The arms loadout system allows you to select three different arms to choose from at the start of a round, which allows players to experiment and see which arms will synergize with their character's unique traits and what will work well against their opponent. The system is all well and good, but the main problem with the system at launch was the grind to get all the arms for each character was just absurdly long. This is because not only did you have to unlock the 30 distinct arms for each of the 10 characters individually, leading to a whopping 270 arms to collect if you exclude the 3 default arms every character starts with, but you also had to unlock plus arms. Plus arms are basically the exact same as base arms one can unlock, except they add 10 more damage to an arm's base damage and have better overall performance. Naturally, this slight increase in damage and performance is pretty important not only for the most competitive folks out there, but also for those that just want to have a fair fight. The plus arms add 300 more arms to unlock, leading to a whopping 570 arms in total to collect at launch. The process of unlocking all 570 arms at launch took over 100 hours. This is insane. The sheer amount of time you had to spend with the game before you could play with all the toys it had on offer was absurd. Despite this, there actually is not a problem with the concept of starting with a few arms for each character and unlocking more as you play. For some, it might seem terrible to put such a large gate in front of such an important part of the gameplay, but in actuality it helps players slowly get acclimated to this new type of game. It slowly drip feeds new arms to you via the rather fun arms getter minigame and lets you learn the traits of each arm with each character instead of overwhelming you with an abundance of choice at the start while you're still learning the intricacies of this new type of game. It's actually a really nice progression system that encourages experimentation and learning. It's just that in its early days it was quite excessive, but moving on, despite the glaring issue of there not being a lot of content at launch, version 1.0 was actually a super exciting time to be playing the game. The game was hot off the presses. People were discovering new things all the time, as is customary during the launch of a new fighting game. The game was a breath of fresh air with new tricks and powerful arm loadouts being discovered regularly. Ranked and party matches were thriving with activity and the foundation for a game that could be expanded upon had been laid. To put it simply, the gameplay of ARMS is phenomenal, but to fully understand what ARMS did different from its 3D arena brethren, one must first understand how games like Virtual On, Gundam Vs, For Honor, and other licensed anime fighters tackled the same problems. Virtual On, created in 1996, is the most notable series in the 3D arena fighter genre. It's widely considered to be the primary source for many of the staple mechanics and concepts found in the genre, such as an emphasis on movement and positioning, projectile tracking, lock-on, camera management, dangerous close quarters encounters, and stage obstacles. All these mechanics came about as a result of the unique challenges that come with creating a 3D fighting game which I mentioned earlier. Zega's development team, Zega AM3, creatively navigated their way around these problems of conveying distance in the 3D space by instead of making a game around the idea of fisticuffs, they made a game based around the idea of projectiles. This idea solved a ton of issues. When projectiles are the primary form of attack, 
it's much easier to give each character clear, exaggerated animations to telegraph different attacks. Along with this, distinct visuals for every attack can be created which can help attacks be easily seen regardless of distance on the battlefield. However, while using projectiles as the main means of engagement was a good design decision, there would still be issues in the game where characters had access to extreme amounts of mobility. How exactly would one hit a fast moving opponent that's deliberately trying to avoid attacks? There's a lack of tactile precision here that makes it really hard for the battle to be enjoyable at this point. So instead of slowing down the speed of the game to a crawl to compensate for this lack of precision, the developers made three decisions that would alter how their game could have ended up. They added a lock on camera, they made projectiles capable of tracking their movement, and they made clear points of end lag occur after key actions had been performed. The addition of a lock on camera makes following the opponent amid a sea of projectiles and explosions much more manageable. But uniquely, instead of the camera always being locked on to an opponent like in 3D Arena Fighters that came out later, Virtualon opted instead to have the camera lock on only after jumping or attacking during a dash. To summarize, to lock on onto an opponent and have the highest chance of hitting them in virtual on, the player themselves must commit to an option that has end lag, which leaves them exposed to an attack afterward. And with the added projectile tracking mentioned earlier, it's much more likely for an opponent to hit you during a point of vulnerability, now more than ever before, because their attacks will follow you. In fact, exploring these exaggerated points of vulnerability while also covering your own becomes a core part of the gameplay. In exchange for the developers giving players incredible movement options to evade as well as projectile tracking, they made camera management and other key options have a high commitment to them to ensure that the game wasn't just a pure game of evasion and also just wasn't a pure game of aggression. In addition to this, melee attacks in virtual on were made to be extremely powerful to compensate for how hard to land they can be due to the fast mobility systems in place. This idea of making melee attacks stronger is conceptually a great idea as it encourages the usage of close range attacks as a viable option. While they're hardly the chain of multiple hits that fighting game players have come to expect from more traditional fighters, it serves its purpose adequately here. Another thing that Virtual On pioneered is the importance of stages. In more traditional fighters, stages are relatively unimportant because all the stages tend to have the exact same properties. However, in a 3D arena fighter like Virtual On, aspects such as uneven terrain, water that slows down movement, and physical obstacles that can get in the way of attacks are commonplace. It forces players to be more aware of the 3D space and be wise in their uses of the terrain. It also cements a unique aspect of using cover like a shooting game and stage obstacles as fundamental parts of the genre. This is something that would be further expanded upon by other games such as ARMS. The legacy of Virtual On upon the 3D arena fighting genre cannot be understated as its DNA can be found in pretty much all games of this style to some degree. However, despite this series' age, its design has rarely ever been matched by any other game that's come out later. That is, excluding the Gundam vs. series, of course, which can be viewed as almost a spiritual successor in some ways. Gundam vs is a long running series with a similar structure to Virtual On that has evolved from a rather average, slow arcade 2 vs 2 mech game into a fast paced and robust 2 vs 2 fighting game. The interesting thing about this though is that the core structure of its gameplay has actually remained pretty much the same since its inception in 2001, but numerous releases have seen the gameplay tuned and the vision behind it more clearly defined. It wasn't really until 2011 that the series fully hit its stride mechanically when the developer, Viking, came out with Gundam Extreme vs. Differing itself from Virtual On, modern Gundam vs. games are typically much faster than Virtual On. They also focus primarily on 2 vs. 2 combat as opposed to the more traditional 1v1. 
these alterations to the core template provided by Virtualon meant new mechanics and ideas were brought into the mix to balance the game. These alterations would include the introduction of a boost gauge, a permanent lockdown camera, a more extensive melee combat system, friendly fire, the burst meter, a cost system, team composition, front and back positioning, and team communication. So basically, they added a ton of stuff. Anyhow, due to the increased speed of the game in comparison to Virtualon, enemies naturally became harder to hit. In order to retain tactile precision in a game where the player was keeping track of not only two opponents, but their partner as well, the camera was set to always be locked onto enemies to reduce camera management and animations were made to be even more exaggerated, so as to make attacks and movement options easily identifiable. UI elements were also added to make crystal clear the distance in which projectiles do not track. The distance in which projectiles do track direction projectiles are coming from off screen and when your opponent has invincibility frames it cannot be attacked. In addition, to make sure enemies can be punished for their high speed movement, a boost gauge was tied to all actions within the game, including dashing. This means that the lower your boost gauge is, the longer your recovery is, and the more susceptible you are to enemy attacks in that brief period of recovery. And in the event that the player's boost gauge drains completely, they overheat punishing them for inefficient usage of boost by leaving them vulnerable for much longer than usual. This idea of efficient boost management adds another level of strategy and promotes skilled movement to succeed. In a sense, it doubles down on the strengths that the 3D fighting game has. It empowers the movement of players without sacrificing tactile precision or imposing gargantuan restrictions. In a game where speedy movement and evasion are central to the experience, if melee attacks were not adjusted to compensate, then there would be little incentive to use melee. However, the developers followed in the footsteps of Virtualon to tackle this issue by making melee attacks rather devastating, but unlike Virtualon, made them capable of being performed without harsh commitment. Since Gundam vs is a 2 vs 2 game, the developers basically let players go wild in terms of melee combos. Melee attacks can continue for long periods of time and do loads of damage if landed. Players also have the ability to dash, cancel out of attacks, and other actions to reduce commitment to these actions, a far cry from Virtualon's quick single hit melee attacks. Why would they allow this one might ask? Well the reason is because the player's partner should be able to cut these combos in a fight. If someone is looking out for their partner, they're not going to let them eat all that melee damage if they get stuck in a combo. They'll cut that combo with a projectile or some other kind of attack. In this way, melee attacks were given a purpose in this faster game without becoming problematic. However, despite such empowering projectile and melee attacks being at the player's disposal, careful and deliberate uses of attacks is encouraged as friendly buyer does indeed do damage to teammates. This encourages cooperation because it forces one to consider their partner's position on the field and not recklessly use large-scale attacks. Nothing is worse than having a teammate hit you with their ginormous beam attack while you're in the middle of performing a high damage combo and you end up taking the brunt of the damage because they weren't paying attention. The game has friendly fire to promote more disciplined play and to encourage others not to do bad stuff like that unless it's absolutely necessary. In addition to all this, Gundam vs also has its own version of the traditional fighting game super meter called the burst meter. The burst meter, when sufficiently filled and activated, applies temporary buffs to the player's offense or their defense depending on which variant of burst they chose before a match. It also allows the player to perform a special burst attack for massive damage should they choose. The introduction of this super meter to this arena fighter adds another layer of strategy to an already thick layer of rich decision making gameplay. Gundam vs's team focus doesn't stop there as the cost system heavily supports it. Gundam vs. this cost system is how developers deal with wanting to create a roster of varying levels of power, ability, and movement through the Mobile Suit Gundam anime without having the obviously strong ones in the roster be the obvious choice to pick every single time. Every mobile suit in the game is assigned a cost that is tied to how powerful they are. High cost mobile suits have more boost, health, and mobility, while low cost mobile suits have less boost, health, and mobility respectively. In a match, both players on a team share a team cost gauge that dictates victory or defeat. A higher cost suit, while more powerful, depletes more from the team cost gaze than the lower cost suit. This leads to teammates having to make important decisions in regards to their team composition so as to make sure that their team is well balanced. Whether a player is positioned in the more offense based position in the front or the more support based position in the back is primarily decided by the cost of the mobile suit they pick. And in battle, it's important for teammates to keep tabs on each other through the in game communication system or through just talking so that they can be aware of where they are in terms of health and so that they can best pace out their deaths in accordance with the cost system. All these systems have been added to the core design that Virtualon pioneered to make a game that, just like Virtualon, is still intuitive and simple to play at its core, only this time it instead focuses on 2 vs 2 combat. 
Gunniverse's own innovations paved the way to a stellar 2 vs 2 game at the cost of the balance of 1v1. The game simply doesn't work well in 1v1 due to the choices they made to accommodate 2 vs 2, such as doubling down on powerful and escapable melee combos and how high cost suits have little to no downsides in a 1v1 encounter, which invalidates a large portion of the massive roster these games have. Of course, none of this is particularly important since this game wasn't designed around this, but it's important to consider why exactly the structure wouldn't translate so easily into a 1v1 focused game like ARMS. For Honor, released in 2017 and developed by Ubisoft Montreal, is an interesting beast because it takes elements that are staples of the 3D arena fighter genre and twists them to create an entirely unique take. The result is a game that is quite fun to be sure, but also has a wide host of issues in regards to battle legibility, game balance, and an unfocused vision. The thing about For Honor that separates it from the previous two franchises I've talked about is the fact that it's primarily a game that focuses on melee attacks rather than projectiles, and it has popular 4v4 modes in addition to the pure of 1v1. This change in focus dramatically alters the flow of battles by slowing down the pace of battles and the movement speed to compensate for the fact that you have less time to react because you're generally much closer to your opponent than a typical arena fighter. One problem that has arisen due to some innate artistic choices is that battles aren't nearly as legible and easy to read. This is because instead of being stylized like most arena fighters, For Honor opted to use a more realistic style. This stylistic decision might seem like a non-issue at first, but it actually does create some problems. Most fighting games choose art styles that pop off the screen with exaggerated character designs and poses to match. The development team behind the granddaddy of fighting games, Street Fighter, recognized this too. In a GDC talk about the art direction of Street Fighter, Capcom's Toshiyuki Kamei, art director for projects such as Street Fighter 4 and Street Fighter 5, has said art in fighting games is the singular element that can convey information to players in a fraction of a second. The development team at Capcom actually tried a realistic art style when prototyping Street Fighter V, but quickly found out that it actually made the game harder to play, so they changed it back to their more traditional, exaggerated style. They chose to optimize how their art serves its function of quickly relaying information to the player. Realistic proportions may look nice, but they inherently create imagery that is less readable in a competitive setting due to how poses are less dynamic and character silhouettes and attacks are harder to distinguish from one another. One can tell For Honor in particular struggles with clearly relaying gameplay information to the player simply because of how much the UI is used to assist in areas where the animation and telegraphing of attacks fails. UI elements are used to indicate a lot of the major actions because things aren't clear enough otherwise. For example, UI indicators are always used to indicate which guard stance the player and their opponent is in. The animation for each guarding stance makes it somewhat clear as to what direction is being guarded, but the UI indicator is critical to make sure that information is sent to the player as quickly as possible. Another example of this problem will be how the easiest way to perform parries is not even through looking at the animation of attack, timing when the opponent's attack is right about to hit and countering, but rather through simply looking at the UI and waiting for the UI to flash red instead. For Honor's reliance on UI indicators is a concession made because their realistic style hampers its ability to convey critical gameplay information quickly to players. For Honor's reliance on UI indicators only serves to make decision making on the part of players feel more binary and less deliberate when they don't necessarily have to pay attention to where weapons are positioned in battle in natural visual tells, which is the whole point of For Honor's art of battle system. Another issue For Honor has is in its balance. Unlike most good arena fighters, for Honor is skewed very heavily towards a defensive playstyle. This is due in large part to how good blocking and parrying are in this game. Blocking in For Honor is a passive element that is always active for the majority of characters. This invites players to always play off reaction rather than reads, also known as prediction. In addition to this, the stamina bar doesn't really serve a purpose of creating punishable openings like it should. The neutral, the state in which neither player has an advantage, we sits very quickly upon attack being defended against. So much so that stamina really comes into play if you're on defense. 
This is because blocking an attacker doesn't drain stamina on the part of the defender, nor does it put the defender in a disadvantageous position after the fact like it probably should. It instead only puts the attacker in a disadvantageous position because they're the one that has wasted stamina at the end of the day. Developers have been attempting to rectify this by making light attacks faster and giving characters feints to make offense more powerful, but this has only really put a band-aid on a glaring wound. The small health pool of most characters means that there's very little time to adapt or learn an opponent's patterns, especially with the creation of faster light attacks. Attacks are either extremely fast and hard to properly read and adapt to given the small health pool, or too slow and easily countered by an overpowering passive guard and parry mechanic. This is only made worse by the frame rate disparity between console and PC, where the frame rate is only 30 frames per second on console in comparison to 60 frames per second on PC. It essentially means that balance on console, where the majority of the player base resides, funnily enough, is forever out of whack as the game is balanced around 60 frames per second. For Honor's lack of focus has also hampered its growth into becoming a good arena fighter. Around launch, it seemed as if 1v1 was the intended For Honor experience, but after a prevailing defensive meta emerged, the meta being known as the prevailing characters and strategies as deemed by the game's community, balance changes seem to skew more towards balancing the more popular 4v4 modes instead of the 1v1. This seemingly unfocused approach to balancing For Honor's many different modes has led to the creation of a game searching for a semblance of balance in different ways in all of its different modes. For example, in a 1v1 fighting game, reliance on UI indicators to do the heavy lifting the animation should be doing is bad. But in a 4v4 match, it's almost a necessity and makes a ton of sense amid the chaos. Overall, For Honor's focus on close quarters and counters has made the game nigh impossible to balance due to the neutral game being a messy mix of reactive and proactive play, a lack of focus on movement options, hard to read animations, and transitions between advantage and disadvantage states not being fluid. Most anime fighters use the template created by Virtualon as a base for their games. However, despite many of these games attempting to use a winning formula, they all have a similar issue that usually boils down to clumsy movement, poorly balanced projectiles, and a reliance on melee attacks for many members of their rosters. Movement is the core of a 3D arena fighter, and that's generally something all anime fighters screw up in a major way, from Dragon Ball's slippery and precise flying to Jump Force's stiff jogging. The movement in these games typically just has bad game feel, or at best doesn't promote skillful and deliberate usage of what limited movement options are actually available. Another issue that often crops up in these kind of titles is the poor balancing of projectiles. Projectiles in anime fighters are usually either one of two extremes. The first extreme being that they have poor projectile tracking, which means that they're nigh impossible to hit people with reliably given the movement capabilities of other characters, or the second extreme which is that they have super strong projectile tracking, which means characters that have weak projectiles or straight up don't have projectiles are pretty much useless. These two possible extremes are then worsened by the last issue that most anime fighters face, which is the fact that a lot of these games, much like the anime they're based off, prominently focus on melee combat. This generally means that close quarters combat, typically not the strongest aspect of arena fighters, as has been explained earlier, becomes a focal point. It's easy to see how this might be a problem when clunky movement and overpowering projectiles get added into the mix. As a result, despite having the basic structure to make a solid game, they fumble hard in execution due to certain design choices. Anyway, that should sufficiently explain some of the core do's and don'ts of 3D arena fighters. I thought about bringing up one last example of a game that forgoes pretty much all the design principles that I had talked about just now that are essential to making a good 3D arena fighter, but I think having the gameplay speak for itself in the background of this little animation is uh, adequate. I mean, um, come on, look, it doesn't it looks dreadful, doesn't it? It doesn't even have a lock on. Anyhow, back to ARMS. Hey! ARMS follows in the footsteps of Virtuon, but makes some interesting alterations to the movement and positioning, projectile tracking, lock on, camera management, close quarters and counters, and stage obstacles to create something entirely unique. First of all, unlike Virtualon and Gundam Versus, the end lag for basic movement options and arms is small. 
There's no easily punchable state that comes about from dashing, for example. This decision to remove large amounts of end lag on the whole improves the feeling of movement overall by making it feel more fluid as opposed to the more start and stop nature of its contemporaries. To compensate for this greater amount of control, ARMS makes you much more vulnerable during an attack than in other 3D arena fighters. ARMS also uses a lock-on system reminiscent of Virtua. While you're standing still, the camera will not lock onto your opponent. However, if you move in any way, whether that be through walking, dashing, or jumping, the camera will lock onto your opponent. Shielding makes the camera lock on as well. In addition to this, the camera stops tracking when you throw a punch, but it will realign if you short dash, short hop, or walk. In short, camera management in ARMS is all about using movement options to readjust your lock on while at the same time avoiding attacks. Projectile tracking is interesting in ARMS because unlike Virtual and Gundam vs, distance from an opponent and how much a projectile homes in on an opponent aren't the only variables to consider. This is because ARMS places a great deal of emphasis on manual aiming to hit an opponent. Attacks in ARMS home in on opponents in a less extreme manner than contemporary titles as a result of this design decision. In the game, the tracking capability of every ARM is dictated primarily by two stats, homing and curving. Homing is about what you would expect. It determines how much an arm will home into your opponent. To give an idea of what is being said, the aptly named homing arm is a missile arm with a lot of homing capability, while the glove arm known as the nade mostly has no homing capability whatsoever. Curving on the other hand is how much an arm can curve when you throw a punch. To give an example, a more straightforward arm like the retorture doesn't have a lot of curving capability, but an arm like the aforementioned nade has an extreme amount of curving capability due to how little homing capability it has. Every arm has a different mix of homing and curving stats. These two stats in addition to how the variable of distance can affect an arm's homing and curving capability are the key aspects that determine projectile tracking in arms. Dangerous close quarters encounters are another aspect that arms modifies from the legacy of Virtuon. Instead of opting for Virtuon's cutthroat single hit melee attacks as a reward for finding an opening, arms' design allows for a close quarters game that ends up being a more of a mix of a traditional 3D fighting game approach and Gundam Versus. Arms at close range doesn't have a dedicated attack option specifically meant for up-close usage like other 3D arena fighters. The game fundamentally operates the same way in these situations, but what makes it interesting is that movement and lag becomes more important at close range. At a distance, it's much harder for players to punish the openings that regular movement creates, but at close range, the end lag from a well-read dash can leave you open to punishment. In these scenarios, all the techniques I mentioned earlier, short hopping, short dashing, and walking, become paramount to coming out on top as their effects on projectile tracking become even more exaggerated up close. In this way, the close quarters encounters in arms are quite similar to Gundam vs. Rainbow Stepping Wars, or the kind of chaos a good sidestep can create in a Tekken match. It's a volatile exchange that rewards smart movement. Stage obstacles in differing terrain are something that Virtual Arm pioneered back in the day, and it's a concept that has been iterated on in not only most 3D arena fighters, but even in some traditional 3D fighters. ARMS takes this concept even further by making stages have a great deal of impact on how fights play out. For example, elevation differences can mess with not only projectile tracking, but the lock-on camera as well. Breakable pillars can serve as cover from attacks and favor defensive playstyles. Different types of arms, such as curving arms, which curve in an arc, can gain an advantage on stages like this as well. However, when all the pillars are broken, the stage is open to more aggressive play and tactics. Trampolines can change the dynamic of a match and allow for the previously mentioned benefits of a height advantage while forsaking most defensive options, like blocking. Trampolines also open you up to what is known as a Yabuki combo, a combo which can be done by activating Rush after grabbing or punching an opponent onto a trampoline. The simple combo's name was derived from an invitational tournament where ARMS producer Kosuke Yabuki defeated the champion of the Invitational in a previously unseen manner using this combo. Ribbon Ring's blocks act as not only a way to visually obfuscate your opponent, but also as a way to gain a height advantage. Conveyor belts and unbreakable pillars can disorient and enforce game plans that focus on utilizing cover. The Snake Boards and Snake Park provide a unique vehicle for extremely safe and quick movement. The cars in Cinema do serve as an obstacle that shields you from damage but also allow you to jump high in the air to mess with camera tracking. Pretty much all the stages in ARMS have a variation on a unique gimmick that heavily factors into the potential strategy. The best part about this is that competitive ARMS has embraced this aspect of the game with open ARMS. In most fighting games, stages that don't fall into a uniform or flat terrain are banned, or stage selection is not given any thought because they all functionally are the same and it has no impact on the gameplay. 
competitive arms that use its well-balanced digits as a way to further the pre-game strategy. ARMS also takes a page out of the visual design playbook Street Fighter introduced by using an art style that is graphically impressive, particularly for a Switch game, yet is simple to read. It often goes unnoticed after a while of playing, but there actually are a good deal of particle effects and other impressively stylish graphical touches in ARMS. However, the game opts for visual clarity over flashiness in pretty much every aspect. As a result of this more minimalist approach, it's very difficult to lose sight of what is happening on screen at any given time. Quote, we had two basic principles. Make sure that the trajectory of the extending arms is easy to visually distinguish, and keep the number of things players have to learn to a minimum. With these in mind, development of arms began in earnest. Unquote. ARMS is a game that sets out to create complexity through multiple layers of simplicity, which is to say that it has multiple elements that are relatively easy to understand on their own, but when they come together it forms something vastly more complex than what appears on the surface. To elaborate on what I mean, I'll use an outside example first, then explain how ARMS specifically does this. In a game like Pac-Man, the four ghosts, Blinky, Pinky, Inky, and Clyde, each have their own distinct personality that dictates how they would chase Pac-Man. Blinky directly pursues Pac-Man, usually falling directly behind him. Pinky attempts to ambush Pac-Man, trapping Pac-Man by targeting a couple spaces ahead of Pac-Man's current position. Inky attempts to circle around in front of Pac-Man using a combination of Blinky's position and a small space ahead of Pac-Man. And Clyde usually chases Pac-Man in the same manner as Blinky, but upon getting within a certain distance, he'll run away from Pac-Man. On their own, none of these individual behaviors are complex. In fact, it'd be rather easy to formulate a plan to circumvent just one of the ghosts in the maze. However, when these simple behaviors are brought together, they form a whole that's infinitely more complex and difficult to plan around. Pac-Man himself also furthers this concept. He's a being that can only move in the four cardinal directions and only has the goal of eating all the dots in a maze. He's simple to control and his goal would be easy to complete on its own with no obstacles. But with the addition of the ghost, his goal becomes a more complex task to complete. Pac-Man and the four ghosts are all extremely simple on their own. But combined, they create a kind of complexity that allows for players to make decisions that require more thought. ARMS uses this idea of layers of simplicity in a way only it could. The basic combat system in ARMS is pretty simple on the surface, especially in comparison to other fighting games. In terms of execution, it's not complicated. Even your methods of attack are all variations on the simple input of a punch. While there are nuances to the movement and combat that take time to master, it's not on the level of some other games out there. However, the basic mechanics of punching, blocking, dashing, etc. are only one layer of arms. Another layer would be the fighters themselves. Again, on their own, a character in arms does not even come close to the complexity of those in most traditional fighting games. The unique attribute that each character has is just enough to make them all feel and play distinctly different, but the game never adds more attributes than necessary to make this change noticeable. The next layer of arms would be the arms loadout system which allows you to pick three different equipable arms before the start of a match and swap between those three before rounds. As of the last major update, there are 42 different equipable arms in the game. Each arm has their own elemental attribute, weight class, homing stat, curving stat, hitbox properties, extension speed, tracks and speed, and rush attack properties. All this information may seem complicated to keep track of, and it is, but the arms loadout system ensures that you only have three arms on you at any given time. This fact keeps this layer of arms simple as well. The final layer of arms will be the stages. As I said previously, most of the stages in arms have a gimmick, usually not more than two in order to keep the intent of the stage crystal clear. All these layers of simplicity combine to form something truly complex when it's all said and done. For an obvious example, the combat and movement mechanics are heavily augmented by the character you pick. Your dash speed, air dash speed, dash distance, air dash distance, walk speed, jump speed, jump distance, jump height, jump flotation, hit stun duration, charge duration, rush activation speed, and girth, also known as arm size, are all determined by your character. This is all in addition to the character's specific attributes. The arms loadout system is augmented by character choice. Which arms you bring into battle is based heavily around the strengths and weaknesses of not only your character, but your opponent's character as well. Which is to say that while you may only be bringing three arms into a match at any given time, you need to be aware of how all 42 arms synergize with your character, how they synergize with your opponent's character, and how well those arms work when used against your character. The stage augments your character in arms loadout. An aggressive rushdown character, for example, will prefer smaller stages and arms that facilitate aggressive play. 
All this was done in an effort to lower the execution barriers present in traditional fighting games, to make the mind games more easily accessible, and to make core fighting game concepts more easily identifiable. This is evident by a comment Yabuki made in an interview with Time where he said it's very important the time it takes for the punch to land and the arm to return, which opens up different intervals for choosing your next movement or the attack's landing. A core part of ARMS is centered around this concept of extension and retraction. This idea is more commonly referred to as startup frames, active frames, and recovery frames in most action games. The development team aimed to clearly communicate the basic elements of a fighting game with easy to understand visual elements, such as how when an arm is extending or contracting, the character is leaving an opening in the defense because they'll be unable to block while these actions are taking place. The way ARMS visually exaggerates the action of a punch allows players, particularly those not super experienced with fighting or action games, to more easily intuit why they're getting hit. This is something that makes learning an ARMS a smoother process than it can be in some other games, but it's not the only element that factors into it. ARMS is a game where your skill in 1v1 matches is intended to naturally increase as you play the various different modes. There are a handful of different modes in ARMS that do this. The basketball themed minigame called Hoops is meant to not only teach you how to land and evade grabs, but is also meant to teach you how to build the rush meter and avoid rush attacks. The target practice minigame known as Skill Shot is meant to improve your skill at aiming, and V-Ball serves the purpose of teaching camera management. As activities, these minigames have problems when it comes to the overall fun factor in comparison to the one-on-one -on -one bouts, but these modes do do a decent job teaching the player important basics in a manner that doesn't feel like a tutorial. The game also ensures that players will no doubt play these modes many times throughout their time with the game. ARMS also aims to lower the barrier to entry through Party Match, which has a lobby size of up to 8 people. Party Match is the primary online multiplayer mode in ARMS, and it was designed around being as inviting as possible. Fighting games are at their absolute best when they are played with real, flesh and blood humans. AI battles can give you a small taste of just how fun things can be, but it doesn't compare to fighting an actual person. Despite this, many people find playing online and fighting games to be a brutal and unwelcoming experience. This is partially due to online toxicity in general, but it also has to do with the fact that no one enjoys getting consistently defeated, smacked, whooped, curb stomped, and bodied like a knuckle at McSpazitron as a mere introduction to a game. And unlike a lot of online games, failure can't be distributed across a team. It lies solely on the individual's shoulders. The development team likely recognized this as a hurdle that had to be overcome in order to not only help the audience engage with the best part of their game, but also to help broaden the audience for their game. ARMS overcame this problem in its party mode, where various different modes in addition to the typical one-on-one -on -one can take place, such as V-Ball, Skill Shot, Hoops, Free For All, Headlock Scramble, and Versus Headlock. Where one player might dominate in a one-on-one -on -one bout, another might do well in the game of Hoops or V-Ball. Team fight and team variations of modes like V-Ball, Skill Shot, and Versus Headlock bring cooperation to the mix and serve as a nice way to break up the one-on-one -on -one action. Working together and using all your might to strike down a common foe is something that just innately feels good for a lot of people, especially after a difficult fight with everyone against Headlock. Cooperative elements in matches is something that makes losing in a one-on-one -on -one fight later on not feel as bad because you end up forming a little bond with the other players in your lobby, however small that competitive kinship may be. Handicaps, automatically given to those on a winning streak, keep winners on their toes, and boosts given to the losers, such as a filled rush meter at the start, help give those having a rough time get a bit of reinvigoration. Naturally, this leads to moments where you have no hope of winning if you're dominating and have a handicap and other players have boost. But due to the casual nature of the mode, the fact that you're rewarded with more money if you win with a handicap, and the fact that ranked match is there for those who want fair matches all the time, it's not too bad in the grand scheme of things. The variety of modes that are playable in a party lobby also ensure that you're improving a number of different skills without even noticing while you play. Party Match is a phenomenal lobby system and one of the best in fighting games. It is disheartening that Party Match has a drawback of not being able to set the parameters of a lobby, like what stages are allowed or which modes you want to play, but it does all this in an effort to help casual players learn the game in the most welcoming way possible. You can always warm up while you're waiting for a match, the small gestures that can be done in a lobby create a friendly yet competitive atmosphere. Multiple matches can run at the same time, and most importantly, you get in and out of matches extremely quickly. It's hard to feel frustrated by a loss, or feel like you waste your time getting into a match when the load times and matchmaking are extremely quick. Yabuki has even said previously in an interview with Game Informer that a lot of effort and technique goes into limiting the size of the games, and we really think it improves the user experience by shortening the load times and making it quicker to get into a game. And we take into account the animations as well, 
and make those fit into the smaller size to make it more enjoyable for the user's experience. Loading times are extremely important in games where players are expected to stick around for years. If loading times are too long, that leads to an absurd amount of downtime as players accumulate dozens, hundreds, and ultimately thousands of hours of playtime. This is notable because long load times have proven to be a problematic blemish on many modern fighting games. ARMS's quick matchmaking and load times allow for an addictive quality of these games to shine. Just one more match, I say, as I queue up into yet another battle in Party Match or Ranked. And nowhere did this addictive quality really shine quite as bright as it did in Party Crash. Party Crash was added in version 4.0 as a periodic in-game event that added special rules to Party Match. Taking a page as Splatoon's Splatfest, Party Crash was a series of 3-4 day events in which players would choose between two featured fighters to duke it out, level up, and win rewards. Among musical and visual UI changes, Party Crash altered Party Match by adding bonus arms and 5 minute bonus periods that change every 15 minutes. Using one of the chosen bonus arms multiplies the points you receive and speeds the process of leveling up. Using one of the featured fighters in playing during the bonus periods also multiplies the points you receive. Party Crash is honestly a perfect way to drive engagement for an online fighting game. The small milestones, such as certain levels being associated with rewards like badges, encourages players to keep playing. This, in conjunction with the plentiful bonus periods with a handful of game modes that aren't present in a normal party match, and the changing bonus arms, makes players stick around, keeps variety flowing, encourages learning different arms, and encourages learning different characters. It's such a simple and effective way to give less dedicated players a reason to come back every now and then that it's surprising more fighting games haven't implemented similar ideas. One of the central mechanics in ARMS is the customizable equipable ARMS themselves. As of the final major update, version 5.0, there are 42 equipable ARMS in total and 585 ARMS to unlock for all the characters including the plus ARMS. Of these 42 ARMS, there are a variety of different types. Glove arms function like basic boxing gloves. By default, they travel in a straight linear line, but they can be curved. How steep the curve can be depends on the glove. Heavy arms work similarly to glove type arms, however they are bigger, heavier, slower, and do more damage. They can be used to block enemy attacks. Hammer arms are similar to heavy arms, but slam downwards at the end of their flight rather than continue flying forward. Curving arms fly in a wide arc from their starting position before returning. Their trajectory can be modified significantly by curving them. Whip arms, much like curving arms, can be set in many different angles to hit an opponent. They have a slight delay before hitting, so they are best used for predicting where your opponent is going. Multi-shot arms fire many projectiles at once and are therefore harder to evade than other types, but they are generally lightweight and can be knocked down by most of their arms. Missile arms have a heavily pronounced homing property. They cannot be controlled to the same extent as other arms while flying. Beam arms fire a beam that can sweep left or right when curved. Shield arms move slowly and can block multiple hits before retracting. Nunchuck arms have two methods of attacking depending on if the attack is using the air or on the ground. They also have above average homing. Umbrella arms change speed depending on proximity to the opponent. They also have considerable homing ability and large hitboxes. And lastly, unique arms have their own abilities that are not completely shared with any other arms. In addition to those types, there are also the 8 elemental attributes that activate when an arm is charged. Every single one of the 42 arms has one elemental attribute. Arms with a fire attribute will knock down fighters and typically do more damage than other attributes. Arms with the electric attribute will have the effect of disabling a fighter's arms, sharply lowering their movement speed and rendering them unable to throw punches for a short period. Arms with a wind attribute will blow fighters a short distance in the direction of the punch. Arms with a stun attribute will render fighters unable to move for a short period of time, allowing for a quick follow-up attack. When an arm with the explosion attribute connects with a fighter, it will hit like a normal attack initially, but then that initial hit will trigger and combo into a subsequent explosion hit. Hitting a blocking opponent, wall, or the opponent's arms will also trigger the explosion. Arms with the ice attribute will freeze fighters, causing them to slow down and become unable to jump or dash temporarily. Additionally, fighters' punches will travel at a noticeably slower speed while frozen, and their arms will be unable to build or hold a charge as long as the effect persists. Arms with the blind attribute have the effect of obscuring the opposing player's vision. Phases of fighters who have been hit by a blind weapon will appear to be covered in whatever substance the arm is made of. Opponents hit by an arm with the poison attribute will have their health drained away. 
The standard amount is one damage approximately every half second, but if an opponent is already poisoned and is hit by another poison arm, the damage will rise to two, then to three if hit again. While poisoned, afflicted targets will regularly stutter during their animations, slowing the overall pace of their movements. And lastly, there are a handful of arms that have no attribute whatsoever, even when charged. And as mentioned earlier, every arm is classified as a light, medium, or heavyweight and falls into one of two types of rush attack categories, mono and flurry rushes. The sheer variety of arms on offer allow for varied playstyles even with just one character. For example, there is a great difference in how you play Lollipop using the multi-shot blind arm Biffler and the beam arm Dragon versus Lollipop using the multi-shot explosion arm Triblast and the heavy poison arm Glusher. The first loadout is more defensive by nature. The Biffler serves as a fast poking tool that can be used from a distance and up close to set up for grabs. The Dragon functions as a zoning tool, which is another way of saying that it's intended to control space and keep the opponent at a distance. With Lollipop's high amount of mobility options, this arm combo is capable of achieving a lot of bizarre angles that make the character hard to hit. One trade-off of this loadout, however, is that the rush is extremely hard to land. Due to the Biffler being a light arm with a mono rush, it has a rush that requires no player input when it hits the opponent and can be knocked down with one hit of an arm of equal weight or greater. Which is to say, its rush can easily be stopped if it's foreseen ahead of time. The dragon also takes a long time to fire, which makes the rush almost impossible to land in its entirety without first being set up by the Biffler. The second loadout is far more aggressive and focuses on smothering the opponent. For starters, this combo has a rush that's much easier to land. The Tri-Blast has a flurry rush, which is to say that it requires player input to keep going and cannot be stopped with only a single punch of equal weight or greater like the Biffler. The Tri-Blast functions like a poking tool much like the Biffler, but it can be used in a much more aggressive manner due to the wider horizontal spread and the lingering hitbox left by the explosion. The Glusher being a heavy arm allows it to plow through light and medium arms and apply pressure. The Glusher also synergizes with Tri-Blast as the effects of poison are not overrided when the opponent is hit with explosions. This allows for a movement to be made sluggish by the poison while simultaneously pinning down the opponent with explosions. However, the weakness of this loadout is not only that the defensive wall has more holes, but also the vulnerability it has against heavy characters, since they have armor that can shrug off the effects of explosion and poison to an extent. But anyhow, that was just one example of how just two separate pairs of arms can vastly change your playstyle. While there may not be thousands of combinations actually being used like the initial pre-release directs insinuated there might be, there is still a lot of variation in regards to arm usage due to how well balanced and diverse they are. From the baby chicks that can be seen when you launch the Thunderbird, to the perpetually wriggling serpentine motions of the Slammermander. From the puffs of smoke coming from the nostrils of the Ice Dragon, to the Scorpio scuttling on the ground, there is a lot to love about this aspect of the game. It's easy to see the arms themselves as a core part of the identity of arms when they hold not only so much gameplay importance, but also have so much care put into their design, right down to how they all have a subtly different feel to them through the Switch's HD Rumble technology. The total roster of 15 arms fighters as of the final major update are the other stars of the show. Each character is easy to pick up and play, but hard to master. And while it is easier than most games to transfer skills with one character to another, contrary to popular belief, they all feel distinctly different to play in reality. Springman is a basic all-around fighter. His shock of ability functions like a parry that knocks down incoming punches, which makes it good for getting openings for counterattacks. Furthermore, when Springman's health drops to 25% or lower, his arms become permacharged. His middle of the road design means he doesn't particularly excel or fail in any field. Ribbon Girl is an evasive character designed around increased aerial mobility. She is capable of performing four jumps along with two air dashes and a fast fall to the ground. Despite this, her short charge duration and small arm girth means she has less offensive power than other characters, especially in the air. Master Mummy is a heavyweight character with super armor that keeps him from flinching from uncharged punches. What he lacks in mobility, he makes up for by having the largest arm girth of any character, having the longest charge duration of any character, and having the ability to heal when blocking. Ninjara has the fastest dash speed and the greatest dash distance. His main ability is that he can warp out of harm's way be in an air dash or having his shield hit. This character's exceptional ability in neutral has the trade-off of him having a more difficult time with rush attacks, 
as Ninjaro cannot block normally and can be hit after warping. Mechanica is another heavyweight character that's able to not only hover for a short period in the air, but can also hover dash on the ground for excellent ground movement. Her suit's large frame makes her a big target, but her mobility lends itself well to messing with camera and projectile tracking and building the rush meter fast. Min Min is one of the smallest fighters with an ability that lets her get a permacharged dragon arm on her left arm after she gets a full charge or after she lands a grab. She is also able to deflect incoming punches via kicks done by her air dashes and back dash. Despite her strengths, she has the smallest arm girth without her activated dragon arm. This makes her vulnerable and neutral until she gets an advantage. Helix is a fighter that can stretch their body at will to avoid attacks. His body can extend like a planted tire with his arms charged so long as he stays in tower mode, or he can droop into a puddle when he dashes to avoid attacks and get odd angles for a counter attack. He's a slippery target, but his verticality and lack of a very useful block can be abused to his detriment. Twintail can slow down time with her actress aura. Incoming arms that dare to hit her while she's dashing will be caught and slowed down by actress aura. This gives her ample time to see an attack and react accordingly. This strong ability can seem overpowering, but it can be abused by applying a heavy amount of pressure or timing punches to hit in the gaps where the aura isn't active. Bite and Bark are a duo with a multitude of interesting abilities. A dog called Bark will periodically attack based on whatever Bite is doing. In addition, Bark will act as a shield if Block is held. Bark can also serve as a springboard into the air that sends out shockwaves that parries punches when bounced on. To balance this power, the duo was made into a glass cannon. This is to say that Bite is extremely weak without Bark. Kid Cobra is a fighter that can leap farther than any other character. His jump allows him extreme mobility while his large arm girth gives him a lot of coverage when attacking. He may have lots of vulnerable end lag points due to his reliance on jumping and his slow movement speed without charge, but he becomes quite the slippery speed demon when he can utilize his charge dashes, an ability that allows him to even slip under some types of arms. Max Brass is a fighter that shares Springman's shockwave ability. However, he adds a twist in that he can buff up when he gets a full charge or lands a grab, much like Min Min's dragon arm. A buffed up Brass is granted super armor, improved overall stats, and permacharged arms. His powerful slew of abilities come at the cost of generally having a much more difficult neutral game than Springman due to his large size when buffed. Lollipop is a character with movement based abilities. She can bounce around stages using her air dash, or she can super dash or super jump out of shield. Her block pushes her backward whenever a punch hits her shield, which makes it great for defensive play. Her extreme mobility has the drawback of having extremely punishable end lag. Misango is a fighter that can adapt to any situation. He has a spirit companion that changes color periodically and can be turned into a pillar that can defend against attacks when Misango holds block. But that's not all. Misango can run into the pillar or get a full charge to become possessed by the spirit. Depending on the color of the spirit, Misango's stats and abilities will change. The blue spirit increases Misango's movement stats and allows him to super dash and super jump continuously if charged. This comes at the cost of a decreased arm girth and grab damage. The red spirit turns Misango into a heavyweight, increases his arm girth size, increases his grab damage, and his rush activation speed. The cost for this is that his overall size is increased and his movement speed is decreased. The yellow spirit significantly increases rush gain and creates a protective barrier around Misango when rush is activated. The trade-off is that movement speed is decreased as well as grab damage. Every buff with Misango comes with its distinct advantages and downsides to make note of. Springtron is the riskier counterpart to Springman. His dash distance is less and he lacks Springman's permacharge 25% comeback factor. But in exchange, he has the ability to gain permacharged arms and the best movement stats in the game, surpassing even Ninjara in speed by using his big bang attack. This ability only lasts for a set duration of time before it wears off, and it can be punished if it's not activated with the correct timing, but it can also disable all arms in the playing field if they're mid-flight. Dr. Coil is a fighter that can fly above the ground and change their elevation at will. They also have the ability to turn invisible for a moment when holding block, as well as utilize a temporary third arm after a full charge. This power was meant to be offset by her lack of a jump, which makes her have less options when dealing with wake-up pressure. These varied character archetypes allow for tons of variation in how you play despite their focus on being simple to pick up and play. The differences between the cast appear minor and subtle at best in the beginning, but as players dig into the richness of the layered systems, the nuances of individual characters becomes extremely pronounced. 
especially when ARM loadouts are brought into the mix. During the game's life, it underwent many updates by the developers. It was clear at launch that the game was good, but that it simply needed more content and refinement. At the time though, it was unclear just how responsive the dev team would be to feedback. How good their content updates and game balance adjustments would be was up in the air, including how well they communicate these updates to players. Fortunately, ARM saw a series of free major updates for 6 months that demonstrated that the dev team were not only listening to the player base, but also had a clear vision for what ARMS had the potential to be. Asked for button remapping? Added. Wanted more tutorials? Done. Need another form of progression to alleviate and lessen the grind for ARMS? Here's the badge system which snatches you an absurd amount of coins and gives you something to hunt for and wear with pride. What about online events to add longevity for casual players? Party Crash has you covered. How about a tournament mode that unlocks all the ARMS to make setting up tournaments easier? They did it. And this isn't even mentioning the exciting character updates that brought anticipation as they tease new characters, stages, and arms. The joy of a major arms update is that it meant something for every single arms player. It wasn't just a new character to try out, a new matchup to learn, or even just a new music track to listen to like in most other fighting games. No, it was something greater. Every update brought a new stage that changed the dynamics heavily and would become prevalent as you continued to play in the future. Even if the new character didn't happen to click with you, the update would not be any less special for you as pretty much every new character brought new arms to the table to play with, even with your character of choice. In some ways, the new arms were even more exciting than the new characters and the slow unraveling of the unique world of arms. Arms proved to be such an unexpected success that the development team even added one more character than initially planned, Springtron, according to a Famitsu interview with producer Yabuki. While it is unfortunate that all this content wasn't there at launch, and as a consequence, not experienced by many, the game that resulted from all those updates is truly phenomenal. If it had launched in the state that it ultimately ended at, with regular party crash events, the badge system which rewards you for doing a myriad of in-game tasks, more tutorials and training modes that teach you how to play, the tournament mode that made online and offline tournaments easier to set up, remappable controls, an easily accessible rank dashboard, and a gallery of images and lore to unlock as another form of progression, I firmly believe the brilliance of ARMS would have been seen more readily and broadly. ARMS, more than mere limbs, capital A-R-M-S can extend like springs, an unusual ability shrouded in mystery. Is it hereditary, a mutation, or the result of extraterrestrial experimentation? We may never know. Historians have attempted to pinpoint the origin, but each attempt has ended in failure, as if held back by an invisible hand. Despite the mysterious nature of this ability, it's well known around the world that certain extraordinary individuals share this gift. Many of them are actually quite famous for using their extendable arms as professional Whoa. fighters in the combat sport also known as arms. For some reason, none of these superstar fighters can remember the moment they first realized they had the arms ability. They just woke up one morning and bam, extendable arms. In fact, one of the arms fighters, Springman, had this to say, I was shocked at first. But having arms like this is actually pretty rad. Prior to release, the effort put into the fantastical yet distinctly modern setting of arms was unknown, especially outside of Japan. Little was known about this world inspired by American superhero comics, professional sports, and anime and manga. In fact, to get details on the backstory and world of arms, you had to look at the Japanese Twitter account for the game which often dropped pieces of historical lore and art. The sheer amount of lore related content being produced by this Twitter account, which I'll have you know was done in character by the game's match announcer, Biff, was astounding. All this interesting content that really made the world of arms seem more interesting than it appeared at the time was being produced, but little of it was actually being presented to the global audience outside of Japan. Luckily, there was a successful effort to get this information translated via fans, but it largely went unnoticed outside of big fans of the game. Tons of information was given about what has been referred to as the ARMS ability. In the world of ARMS, 
this ability has been found in 20% of the population and gifts them with the power of extendable arms. While the earliest historical records relating to the phenomenon date back to around 1,500 years ago, many believe the arms ability has existed for at least 4,000 years. The ability was first considered to be an oddity, but through the arms ministry's work of figuring out a way to control this ability through specially manufactured masks and the creation of the combat sport known as ARMS 120 years ago, it is now perceived as a gift. Over time, the arms ministry split into two organizations, ARMS Labs and the ARMS League. ARMS Labs would focus on foundational research on the ARMS ability, the manufacturing of masks that control the ARMS ability, and the development of products related to the ARMS ability. The ARMS League would focus primarily on the sport in regards to tournament organization, fighter development, and the free distribution of the masks produced by ARMS Labs. In addition to all this, details regarding what is referred to as the second generation, ARMS fighters who do not possess the true ARMS ability, as well as light character backstories were also given via the Japanese Twitter account. This is all to say that, much like Splatoon before it, the world of ARMS is surprisingly fleshed out and intriguing, possibly even more so than people realize due to the lack of proliferation of this information. But for what it's worth, most of this information did make it into the game for all players to see via the gallery, but this is only after the very last update which many people missed out on. Moving on from stuff outside the game though, the world is wonderfully communicated in-game as well. Taking a cue from Mario Kart and less directly Splatoon, the development team created numerous fictitious logos and brands for the game. Every single arm and piece of clothing within the game has a private corporation manufacturer. This adds to the sporty feel as the brands are presented in a way that is not unlike how equipment and clothing brands are presented in real world sports. The stages themselves are also extremely detailed and filled with character. Spring Stadium is a lively boxing arena that's owned and operated by the Spring Gym. It eschews the roofed venues of typical boxing tournaments and opts instead for an open air stadium that is in keeping with ARMS' World Cup vibe. Ribbon Ring, on the other hand, is an exclusive concert venue for Ribbon Girl. Fans on the ground level and on the rafters can be seen cheering with glow sticks as performance lighting dazzles the environment. Ninja College takes a step back from the stadiums by using a traditional Japanese aesthetic instead. It does this by decorating the land with maple trees, showing statues of ninjas wielding weapons such as the Kusarigama, Ninjato, and the Shuriken, as well as incorporating Japanese-inspired architecture. The stage takes place on the stairs leading up to Reizen Ninjutsu University, a school for ninjas. Interestingly enough though, the stage also gives hints of the modern city that lies just outside of this traditional environment. Mausoleum takes place where you might have guessed, near a tomb. It's a burial ground for the dead complete with tombstones, giant ghostly hands, and strange spiral trees under a gloomy night sky. The mausoleum also doubles as a hospital for mummies. Scrapyard takes us to an industrial urban environment that's filled with construction vehicles and pipes of all sizes. It's one of the many stages that provides some lore as well. Scrapyard was built to Mechanica specifications as a special fighting arena. If you look closely, you're actually able to see this is where Mechanica spent their time building prototypes for their mech suit. The numerous CRT televisions around the stage show other arms fighters because of how much she admired the sport as a fan when watching it on TV. Ramen Bowl, amazingly enough, takes place in an actual ramen bowl. As if that inspired idea alone wasn't enough for the team, the ramen bowl stage takes place in what is essentially an extremely detailed Chinese urban metropolis. It's got a gong, it's got ramen food trucks, to put it simply, it's a food paradise that exists in front of Min Min's aptly named family restaurant, the Nintendo Noodle House the Nintendo Noodle House. Snake Park is incredible. If you've ever watched a skateboarding event such as the X Games, especially when they're competing at night, the unique sports vibe they're trying to paint here with this stage will be obvious to you. The stage itself is essentially the equivalent of a skate park with it being the home base of Kid Cobra's team. You got your snake boards, which you can ride on in the middle of the playfield, a half pipe, and a calm city park. To truly sell the urban street look, you even get a great view of the nighttime cityscape. And this may just be a me thing, but I also think it's really cool how there are a fair number of skyscrapers in the background with a spiral shaped design. In addition to that, I also think it's really cool that Snake Park also happens to be underneath a massive highway that extends far into the distance and wraps around a huge building like some sort of coil or spring. This type of minute attention to detail really sells how ubiquitous the arms ability is to this world. DNA Lab is the area in which ARMS research is done by ARMS Labs and the place where Helix was cultivated. So as such, there's a lot of lore info secretly hidden within this stage. 
The six tubes in the arena showcase artificial arm spiders created by arms labs that are simply known as the cell. Documents layer the floor and walls, blueprints on the artificially created fighter helix are displayed on a monitor, and a world map appears to be visible. In addition to this, we have busts of what are likely former arms labs researchers, and a glimpse of the prototype headlock weapon. It's all good stuff, and it's great to see if you're privy to the lore that was described earlier on. Cinema Dew takes inspiration from Hollywood with its lavish limousines, spiral palm trees, and its hardworking film crew that's visible on the sidelines. The row of stars calls to mind the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and the statue of the arms fighter Twintel emphasizes what a big name she is in the world of arms. The stage takes place in front of a theater belonging to Twintel, and the many vehicles on the stage all belong to her. Quite the celebrity indeed. Buster Beach is a large beach resort created by the Arms League, and it encompasses the hoops, skill shot, and b-ball courts as well. These areas in particular are some of my favorite in the game for a couple small reasons, but to get it out of the way, it's not because of the Robocop standing guard doing beach patrol outside the ring, heck it's not even about the fact that they even bothered to make the spiral palm trees here look different than the ones in Cinema Do. oh my god, it's not because of that. What it's really about is this huge freaking bridge which you can visibly see span across the ocean in all the island stages. And better still, it leads to this massive island that has a ton of houses on it, complete with humongous structure on top of all that. The ginormous temple building, whatever it is, also has stone structures that look like fists raising the air for what it's worth too. What I'm getting at here is that we're getting pretty close to some team eco level surreal world design. When I see that bridge, I can't help but think of games like Shadow of the Colossus. I've already talked about how those games and how their architecture and world design inspire wanting to theorycraft in a video much shorter than this one, so I won't waste your time going over that again, but ARMS is giving me a similar desire to speculate and I like that a lot. I just also love surreal, grandiose things in video games in general, so yeah. Temple Grounds is located in the remote region of Bisanga and is a sparring ground that has been holding ARMS matches since long before the establishment of the ARMS League. The temple was built in honor of the god the region was named after, the Misanga, but more notably, Temple Grounds takes inspiration from Mesoamerican culture. And for this particular section, I'm just going to shout out an ARMS community member that goes by Cookies. She's the one that really enlightened me on this particular subject, and I'll be referring back to most of the knowledge she gave me heavily when I talk about Misango and certain ARMS as well. Anyhow, with Temple Grounds, we see a decorated floor, pillars, and a statue head in the back. The head in the back, which apparently has some connection to whatever Biff is in the game, can be seen as a distinct reference to the Olmecs, who were once known to create colossal sized heads for reasons that remain unknown to this day. In addition to this, the Olmecs lived in dense jungle areas similar to the one Temple Grounds is set in. The pillars and decorations on the ground can be viewed as taking elements from the Mayans, and especially the Aztecs as it was common for them to decorate their land, specifically in places where people in positions of higher power were situated. It is also done in a circular fashion, something that was common among the Aztecs and the Mayans due to making them feel as if they were closer to the gods, specifically the god of the sun, moon, and of creation itself. The floor of Temple Grounds also tells a story involving the characters within the game that we are incapable of fully making out. It's possible it relates to the future or some sort of calendar, but it's hard to say. The fact that this land is believed to be the birthplace of the arms ability also lends credence to the importance of this place. Oh, and if you thought they couldn't come up with any more distinctly varied spiral tree designs for Temple Grounds, you thought wrong because they managed to fit some large, coiled up rainforest trees into the mix as well. Via Dolce is basically a small Italian inspired street full of cafes. The place is home to Lollipop's candy shop as well as Biff's bakery. It's a small stage but it's packed with detail in the form of pastries and other goods. Sparring Ring is about as sparse as one might expect, but the notable thing here is that this place is operated by Arms Labs. There are cameras on the walls in order to collect data on arms fighters as they train. Pretty shady stuff from arms labs all around if you haven't noticed it already. This is a feeling that is further supported the more you delve into the lore of the game which is pretty cool. Sky Arena is an outdoor fighting arena built on top of the super skyscraper that houses the arms league HQ. It's here at what's said to be the highest point in the world where the grand prix grand finale goes down. You really get a sense that this arena really does tower over the world as you can see numerous skyscrapers below the stage. You also get a sense of Max Brass's immense ego as you can see a statue of his entire face sculpted into the arena. Name Redacted is Dr. Cole's top secret research facility at Arms Labs. Here you're capable of seeing just how much the doctor examines the sport of arms through monitors 
and the many scientific awards and pet projects that line the walls. As you can see, the stages all have a lot going on in them when it comes to establishing the world of arms. Every stage even has a small map associated with it to give us a sense of geography too. For this video, I even looked into piecing it all together or making connections between locations now that all the updates are done, but it seems nigh impossible to do that with the given information. None of the stage maps line up with the world map seen in DNA Lab, so it's hard to tell whether that world map is just an outdated map of the world that isn't representative of the fact that there might be more continents, or if it simply lacks the necessary detail of the stage maps to be able to recognize what the list stages are. Or you know, there's also the possibility that they haven't really thought any of this world map stuff through at all and I'm just giving them too much credit. But I don't know, I'd like to think that they did. Anyhow, before we move on from the stages, one thing I thought about bringing up was a possible connection between Buster Beach and Temple Grounds. The temple-like structure in the background of Buster Beach bears a resemblance to Mayan and Aztec temples, which leads me to believe that perhaps that island in the background is where Temple Grounds lies. I was actually pretty stalwart on this theory until I looked at the maps for each stage. Temple Grounds is surprisingly the only stage in the game where we get a full map of the region, and it doesn't seem to line up with Buster Beach's stage map at all. It also doesn't seem to match anywhere on the world map seen in DNA Lab either, which lends credence to the idea that the world map there might not be everything. It's hard to say for sure what's going on here since the game is so vague about geography, but I thought it was interesting enough to at least mention. The characters in ARMS are another aspect of the world that I love. The full post-update roster of 15 characters is extremely distinct in terms of their design, and they all have varied cultural influences. The pizza-loving Springman was the first character to be designed for the game, and as such he has a very simple and straightforward design. He's a character that's so clearly inspired by old school manga that it's hard not to conjure up images of the legendary work from Osamu Tezuka or Asaki Takamori when looking at him. Ribbon Girl is a pop star that takes more than a handful of cues from Japanese idol culture. Her voice actress is even a professional singer herself. The college student Ninjara takes inspiration from Japanese ninjas as his name would suggest, but as a twist, the design opts to use the less popularized chain weapons ninjas are known for, such as the Kusarigama, as inspiration. The muscular Master Umi goes against the traditional lanky design for mummies by instead making it appear like he's somehow in the prime of his afterlife. He also has this oddly compelling, serious backstory of searching for his long lost family. Mimin is a food-based fighter that has an arm capable of being transformed into what looks to be a Chinese dragon. Kate Cobra is a live streamer that was brought about through an unorthodox combination of snakes and extreme sports. I don't really have much to add to that. Mechanica is a second generation arms fighter that doesn't naturally have the arms ability but built a mech suit to compete as a fighter. Being a huge fan of Ribbon Girl and having met the arms Grand Prix champion as a child inspired her to become an arms fighter herself. Misango is a character that aspires to show the world that the Misangan fighting technique is superior to all others, and he also takes a ton of inspiration from Mesoamerican cultures. The blue, gold, green, and red colors he can be seen wearing are known as colors the Aztecs utilize in their clothing and are mostly seen in people of high power. The leg tassels that surround his calves were a common trait found on many Mesoamerican warriors. Misango's ankle bracelets and woven arms also tie into Mesoamerican culture as the Mayans were particularly good at crafting woven works and jewelry. Misango's name being a play on words for Misanga, a type of friendship bracelet originating in South and Central America corroborates this idea. The spirit that accompanies Misango also contains some nods to Mesoamerican mythologies. When the spirit transforms into a spiky yellow mask, the sound of a big cat's roar is heard. It wouldn't surprise me if this was inspired by one of the sun gods of the Aztecs, and Jaguar Warriors. Jaguar Warriors were an Aztec military unit known for their skill in battle and were sometimes garbed in the skin of Jaguars. Jaguars have a special connection to the sun gods in some tellings of Aztec myth, which furthers this connection. When the spirit transforms into a blue mask with wings, the sound of a bird is heard. This form no doubt takes inspiration from Eagle Warriors. Much like Jaguar Warriors, Eagle Warriors were an elite military unit and they were known for wearing headgear adorned with feathers and beaks. Considering this form also augments Misango's movement in ways that make him capable of sliding and jumping in ways similar to Kick Cobra, this form can also be inspired by the Feathered Serpent, a creature that is prevalent in many Mesoamerican mythologies and known for its abilities of flight and slithering. All in all, Misango interestingly mixes elements of Mesoamerican warriors and shamans. Bite and Bark are a tag team fighter that serve their duty as beach patrol. 
Bark was originally a support item, but the development team found him charming enough to make an entire character out of him. Their transformation into one combined robot with enhanced stats when Rush is activated calls to mind the docking sequences of mecha anime. Helix is an experiment from Arms Labs that escaped their cultivation too prematurely, with his form being as flexible as goo and his arms being made out of strands of DNA, this two-year-old fighter is a rather unique oddball even among the diverse arms cast. Lollipop is a traveling street performer that wants to open her own circus. Her candy-themed arms also represent the fact that she owns a candy shop. Tuntel is an A-list actress that is an example of how the arms ability can manifest in different ways, including hair. Feedback and advice from colleagues from Nintendo of America and Nintendo of Europe were used to create Twintel. They spent a lot of time trying to get the character right in order to create an awesome female person of color character, an unfortunate rarity in games. Springtron is yet another creation of Arms Labs that happens to be modeled after Springman. His purpose was to show off the prowess of the laboratory and create the ultimate fighter. Dr. Coyle is the mastermind behind Arms Labs that is responsible for all their creations and surveillance projects. She's a sponsor of the Arms Grand Prix and has had a hand involving pretty much anything dealing with the sport in an effort to become the world's greatest arms fighter. Max Brass is the champion and commissioner of the Arms League. He assists in the development of arms fighters and is implied to have some history with Dr. Coyle that went south. The lore of arms is deeper than one might think at first glance. The release of a comic written by Ian Flynn was indefinitely delayed which teased the formation of the character Springman being the third to hold the mantle of Springman, implying some kind of superhero-esque lineage in the universe. Ian Flynn even said when writing the comic that he received a shockingly large amount of internal Nintendo documents regarding the lore of arms that he was excited to have the opportunity to write about. While it's unclear if the comic will ever see the light of day, it's clear art director Masaki Ishikawa the figure responsible for a lot of the lore teamed up a lot of aspects of the universe that we have yet to see. In addition to the visual elements, the world of arms is beautifully communicated through the soundtrack as well. The game's primary musical influence is Brazilian music and the chanting that is associated with sporting events such as the World Cup. This influence results in a sports vibe that can be felt throughout the entire game due to variations of the main theme being naturally interwoven into many areas of the game. An example of how music permeates throughout the title would be how in the character select menu, all the characters dance to the music. Some characters move on beat, others with different rhythmic timing, and some don't move to the music at all. It's a subtle way of characterizing the characters just a tad, and considering the character select screen is among one of the first things players will see, it gives off an immediate impression of what the intangible soul of ARMS is. The main theme of ARMS is also suitably catchy and simple to memorize. The lack of lyrics may be off-putting to some, but it feels tailor-made for groups of people to chant during competition, which would be fitting given the premise of the game. The main characters in competitive games are always the players themselves. It really feels to me that it's not just the dev team, but everyone playing the game as well that are helping to build up ARMS together. ARMS was always designed around being an enjoyable, competitive game contrary to popular belief. In addition to the content updates which introduced characters with abilities more complex than those that came before, balance patches were a common occurrence even a great deal after the last major content update and these balance patches were always carefully constructed and thought out. In Yabuki's 2018 GDC talk, he said, We aimed for an environment where lots of different characters and arms would be used and have adjusted the game balance along the way accordingly. With that being said, they also didn't seek to change characters drastically with updates in an effort to try and not upset players. They sought to accentuate the differences between characters with updates. 
This is something you can tell is the case because out of all the characters, Springtron was the only one that received major gameplay changes via patch. During development, fight data from human players and AI were used to balance the arms, but post-release, development staff and top players from Nintendo of America and Nintendo of Europe staff gave the reports on the game balance. Yabuki and the dev team also paid attention to tournaments from all across Japan, the Americas and Europe too when considering the game balance. When we're balancing, we don't just look at the data all at once, we'll break it down and look at it from different perspectives, like the top 3% of players or just from Pacific regions, said Yabuki. The result of the work put in by the ARMS team is a game that becomes even more fun the more you sink your teeth into it. A game that unlike some other competitive games, radiates brightest not at mid-level or low-level play, but at high-level play. You see, the game is designed around the idea that beginners will tend to play slow and at a distance. Beginners often play this way due to natural flight or flight instincts, telling them that the best way to mitigate damage is to fight at long range. Intermediate players become more accustomed to mid-range and close-range combat, but often lack knowledge on how to make their movement in non-long-range combat scenarios safe. Intermediate players also happen to have a better grasp on arm loadouts and how they can synergize with characters, but they also tend to have a deficit of knowledge when it comes to individual arms and how to make numerous loadouts that are suitable for a variety of different character matchups. Experienced players play faster and are adept at using safe movement to switch from long-range, mid-range, and close-range combat as the battle shifts. Top level players have a deep understanding of the meta game of arms loadouts, arms counterpicking, character counterpicking, and stage selection, and use that knowledge to optimize their character builds. Oh, These ultimately lead to bouts that are full of cunning mind games, lightning quick adaptation, and delightful strategy, even before Arms is called. And as I've said earlier, Arms makes this process of improving fun whether you're using traditional button controls or motion controls. In fact, this was deliberate. Yabuki went on to say in his 2018 GDC talk, we aim to have motion and button controls be equally viable in matches between top level players. While button controls are by far the most common input method for competitive arms, those who choose to play with motion controls aren't put at a disadvantage. One of the best players in the North American region uses motion controls, as well as a slew of top players in Japan. The competitive arm scene may not be the biggest, but the meta for the most part is immensely enjoyable. While there certainly are gaps between the lower tier and higher tier characters, all the characters are viable to some extent. In fact, the only character in the roster that could be considered overpowered and in need of heavy adjustments in terms of balance is Dr. Coil. Her flight allows her to dominate neutral by heavily messing with camera tracking. Her third arm allows her to safely gain rush faster than most of the other characters, and her shorter hit stun duration allows her to avoid follow-ups easier than the rest of the cast. She's a character that, while fun to play, operates completely different from the rest of the cast. As such, the rest of the cast struggles to compete with her due to her insanely versatile and safe mobility. This ultimately limits arm diversity to the small number of arms that can hit her when facing her. That aside, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention the arms community and its history in this section. Despite that, I personally have no desire to get into the weeds of explaining it all here, I will on the other hand recommend watching an action esports video titled The Esport Nintendo Abandoned, What Happened to ARMS. It's a good general overview of the scene from 2017 to 2018, and I along with around 30 other players and tournament organizers helped supply information for the people producing the video. It's pretty great and very slickly produced. Give it a watch if you're interested in learning more about the competitive scene. Anyhow, while the game isn't flawless, the ARMS team ultimately accomplished what they set out to do with ARMS. For Yabuki, games are a tool for creating communication and interactions between family and friends. He describes this as not only his linchpin for making games, but also as the DNA of Nintendo games. In his 2018 GDC presentation, Yabuki said, We wanted to make a game that would create opportunities for communication and interaction. Something where regardless of language, country or age, you could compete against people all around the world, watch their matches, and share stories with them. And if it's been used like that, then we succeeded. While ARMS may not be the most popular title of Nintendo's legendary Switch lineup, its innovative game design, its colorful artistic vision, and the bonds and memories it helped to forge ensure that it would be a beloved game for many years to come.
Thanks, everyone. Time to unwind. Max, 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 Max,